There shall be no misunderstanding by Hildegard Hawthorne Read by Newgate Novelist Nonsense, Archie. Why won't you look at it from my point of view? There's no need of getting angry about the matter. It's simply... My dear girl, I see your point of view without any trouble at all. Of course, you've a perfect right to any opinion you choose to hold. I don't pretend to flatter myself that I should have any influence in getting you to change it. Archie! Well? You are absurd. Just because I don't agree with you, I'm to be accused of selfishness and obstinacy. If anyone is obstinate, it certainly isn't I. Very likely. Perhaps we'd better not talk of the matter any more. The two young people were seated on the veranda of a country house, charmingly embowered in creeping vines, and commanding a wide view of the Hudson and the mighty hills through which it winds. The summer air was full of the fragrance of new-mown hay, and the drowsy murmur of insects lulled the ear, while ever and anon a thrush by the brook rippled into mellow song. Everything spoke of peace, except the two in whose hearts, by right, the perfecting glory of love should have given the culminating touch, for the two were engaged. Yet it so happened that a dispute, trifling in itself, had become magnified and embittered, after the sad human way, until both the man and the girl were in a state where any moment might bring forth some act or word which the rest of their lives would be spent regretting. After Archie's last remark there was silence for several minutes. He leaned back in his chair and looked grimly down at the river, while Eileen, having turned from him with a swift movement, stared nervously across the hills and blinked the tears from her eyes. When she spoke, it was with a measured coldness, which hid the hurried beating of her heart. If we have only been engaged a week, and have already found a topic on which we must be silent, for fear of quarrelling, I think there must be something wrong. If you can say such a thing as that, Eileen, there surely is, replied her lover, hoarsely. Then, then, there's nothing to do but... She stopped abruptly and glanced at Archie, but he still stared at the river and scarcely seemed to have heard her. She sprang to her feet and the angry colour dyed her cheeks. I'm sorry I've been so slow to understand you, Archie, she exclaimed. It's evident we are not suited to each other. The best we can do is... is to forget we've ever been engaged. Archie stood up and looked at her, pale as she was flushed. Do you mean our engagement is broken? he asked. Here is your ring and she tore it off and handed it to him. If your love for me cannot stand a disagreement, Eileen, doubtless you are right. He looked at the ring, and then put it slowly into his pocket. Eileen turned away and began to arrange the magazines on a table. A moment or two passed. Then Archie, without another word, strode down the veranda steps, and, mounting his horse, which stood hitched at the foot, galloped off. Eileen listened to the beat of the hoofs until they died away. Then she went slowly into the house and up to her room. She felt as though she were carrying a great weight, and almost staggered as she reached her door. Tears blinded her as she entered. The perfume of the roses he had brought her that morning sweetened the air. There stood his photograph, manly, handsome, with the smile in his eyes which she knew so well. Archie, 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 she sobbed and threw herself on the bed in a passion of tears. 
how can it have happened what was the matter with us you know i love you archie yes and i know you love me and yet if we had hated each other we couldn't have been more cruel can't a love like ours cast out misunderstanding and vanity and selfishness i would die gladly if my death could save him from any pain and yet i cannot yield a worthless point to him to him who is more than the whole world to me we didn't mean what we said it wasn't we who were talking and yet we have given each other a deadly wound have insulted her love have trampled a holy thing in the dust the hours slipped by and at last eileen roused herself she sat up feeling absently at the fourth finger of her left hand she started as she realized what she was looking for even my little finger misses him she whispered with a pitiful smile behind the house a narrow winding path made its way between the apple trees and past a yellow field of rye through a green wood and over a brook by a pretty rustic bridge beyond that point it wandered on with many a lovely turn giving now and again an enchanting glimpse of the great river until a mile or more farther it joined the highway it had been the custom of the lovers to meet at the little bridge every evening and then to saunter together along the path and home by a short cut across the golf links eileen knew that the hour when she generally started for the trysting place was at hand knew hesitated and suddenly arose he won't be there to-night and i think my heart will break but i will go i cannot stay away the shadows were long under the apple trees as she walked out and the robins fluted joyously the evening seemed too lovely to belong to earth meant for heaven it had somehow lost its way and dropped by a fortunate chance on our world as eileen moved slowly along the fragrant path seeing in the sky the wonderful ever-changing shades of rose and green and purple hearing music from a hundred happy birds breathing the balmy air an indescribable peace came into her troubled heart what though anger and misunderstanding lay behind she knew it was all right now archie would be waiting for her waiting with a look of perfect comprehension and she would not even need to speak but speak she would as she never had before to tell him how deep how great her love was and that never more should a shadow darken it never never the birds sang always more sweetly and the wind among the branches made tender harmonies that chimed with the love in her heart and now she passed the yellow grain and now entered the woods and there indeed midway on the bridge where the sun sent a mellow gleam through the overarching branches stood her lover awaiting her a wave of happiness surged over her taking her breath for an instant she stopped and then ran forward with hands outstretched calling in a voice low but of piercing tenderness my dearest i knew that i should find you i knew you would be here if you had not i think i should have died in a moment they were in each other's arms and at his kiss the last faint doubt or lingering veil of bitterness if any there was passed utterly out of eileen's heart and it seemed to her that in that moment for the first time she knew happiness supreme divine have you waited long not long love archie you forgive me i understand you beloved and what is real beside our love with their arms about each other they sauntered on down the path 
The dying radiance of the sun made a glory about them. The trees whispered and swayed over their heads, and it seemed to Eileen as though she scarcely touched the ground. What indeed was real beside their love? These lovely things about her, these singing birds and fragrant flowers and murmuring leaves, they were only a sort of picture, a reflection of the happiness in her heart. As long as this beautiful happiness lasted, and well she knew that it could never end, so long, too, would this delightful, blossoming world surround them. It must always be glorious summer where they two were. My beloved, said Archie, looking down at her with shining eyes, is not such a union worth a sacrifice? It would be worth any sacrifice. He drew her closer. They had reached an open glade where a clear spring bubbled up inside a circle of rocks and trickled off in a series of tiny pools and streamlets where birds bathed and fluttered. Moved by the same impulse, the lovers seated themselves on the grass beside this spring and remained a while in silence, looking into the crystal depth of the water. Each saw therein the reflection of the other, and to Eileen it seemed that never before had she seen a loftier beauty than was now expressed by her lover's face. He seemed almost to emit light, and half startled, half smiling, she turned towards him. Archie, she cried, catching his hand in hers, let me feel you. I want to be sure you are real. In the pool there you hardly seem to belong to this world. Archie smiled and threw his arm about her. There is only one real world, he replied, and we both belong to that. But give me your hand. There is something missing from it that should be there. Eileen flushed and paled, holding out her left hand with a gesture almost tragic. Yes, put it back, she whispered. The best part of myself is lacking when that is not there. He slipped the ring back and kissed the slender fingers. Never let it come off again. The circle is the symbol of our perfect union, and that stone the shining sign of its immortality. I shall always wear it, said Eileen solemnly, as though she were pronouncing a vow. Come, then, my beloved, the time approaches, said Archie, with a deep tenderness. The time? asked Eileen, dreamily, as they rose. Glancing again into the pool, she caught a last wavering reflection of her lover's features. Surely there was a starry gleam about his brows. They moved on together to what seemed like rhythmic harmony, albeit soundless as a dream. The time, Archie? What time? You will know soon now. But remember, my darling, nothing can really part us. You know that. I know it. They were nearing the end of the path, and only a short way beyond lay the high road. Suddenly, a great dread was born in Eileen's heart. She clung, trembling to her lover. Don't go on, Archie. I am afraid. Don't go on. It is so perfect here, like heaven. I cannot bear to leave it. Archie smiled and the smile held so much of joy, and yet withal so tender a pity, that tears filled Eileen's eyes, even as she leaned against him with a sigh of perfect happiness. It is indeed like heaven, little love, he said, in a voice as deep and musical as the murmur of great pines. But we must go on. 
Do you not understand? Eileen lifted her head slowly and looked into her lover's eyes. Long they gazed at each other, hand clasped in hand, heart against heart. You see, said Archie at last. Eileen turned pale and paler and her eyes grew dark with dread. Not that, my love, not that, she whispered. I cannot bear that. I cannot lose you now. We belong to each other forever. But for a little while. It is the sacrifice. It is the sacrifice. The men stumbled along awkwardly with their load, breathing heavily. Suddenly, they saw a girl step out into the dusty highway. They halted abruptly, looking one at the other with white faces, and trying as best they might to hide from her eyes the nature of their burden. She came steadily towards them, however, and seeing this, they laid what they were carrying by the roadside, and one of them came towards the girl hastily. "'Don't come any farther!' he exclaimed. There's, there's been an accident, and... I know, she answered quietly and stopped. Even in the fading light, he could see she was deadly pale. Then she came on. He is dead, I know. I must see him. They drew aside, one of them muttering as she passed. It was his horse, it fell with him. End of There Shall Be No Misunderstanding by Hildegard Hawthorne